All right, so today, um, this is video two of three of our series on bass trombone tips for band directors, inspiring trombonists, and studio teachers. I have uh, Dr. Jimmy Robertson coming back from our general interview with Dr. Casey Thomas, where they both gave great information from their own teaching to their personal performance experiences. Without further ado, Dr. Jimmy Robertson will share his own bass trombone studies and exercises he does in his personal practice and with his students in his studio at the University of Florida. So here is Jimmy Robertson. Hello everyone, nice to see you all. And uh, thanks for joining us for this short tutorial video. I thought that what we would do today is just do a short play along uh, bass trombone warm up. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to begin on my tenor trombone um, with a, a good introductory mouthpiece to approaching the low register and transitioning to bass trombone and working on that doubling skill. So it's just a, a Bach 2G mouthpiece in, in my uh, Edwards tenor trombone. So a larger mouthpiece than I would typically play um, in my day to day tenor playing. But when I first began doubling between tenor and bass, this was exactly the combination that I employed. I, I got a 2G mouthpiece, put it in my tenor trombone, and got to work on the low register. And that helped me build confidence until I was able to purchase a bass trombone and, and make that uh, transition a little more um, uh, permanent, as it were. So um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and begin. I'm, I'm going to share a screen here with you. And uh, it, this is a, a, a two octave descending arpeggio exercise. So um, this is largely inspired by uh, my teacher in undergraduate school, Buddy Baker. He has an outstanding method book. It's called the Buddy Baker Tenor Trombone Method. And this kind of riffs on the idea of the first playing exercise in his book, which is simply downward slurs. So I, I take that idea, I change it up just a little bit and extend it down to two octaves. Then we invert it, we start down on a pedal B flat, in this case in the key B flat major, and we ascend back up. So we're working on taking our great familiar core sound in the mid register and extending it gradually down through the arpeggio, down to the pedal. And then once we're down there, we're working on establishing consistency of sound and consistency of attack as well as smooth slurs back up through the arpeggio. So it just really extends upon that, uh, expands upon that idea. So um, if you want to go ahead and play along, let's go ahead and, and get our horns ready to go. And uh, But uh, just a nice, comfortable tempo. I won't even necessarily take it at 80. We'll just go at a nice, leisurely, comfortable pace. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and play together. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Before we continue on, I just want to talk a little bit about positions. So I haven't overly notated this with um, set positions that you might want to use, but I just want to talk specifically about the D. So if you're on a, tenor, a single trigger tenor trombone, you want to tune your F attachment so that your, your low F there at the bottom of the bass clef staff is in tune, which then that, that puts the trigger D in about a short fifth position with the trigger. And I'm relating those positions to the B flat side of the instrument. So a short fifth position with the trigger should should net you uh, a good low D down there. Now, um, when we switch to bass trombone, which I'm going to do right now, gives you another option for that low D. You can 
of course, tune so that your load trigger D with both triggers is in first position. So that's the way I do it. All right, here's the trusty old base. So now we'll continue from measure 13 here from the pedal B flat on up. And what I'll do is I'm going to alternate between using a D and single trigger short fifth position and a double trigger first position. So I might just like change it up uh, with each of these ascending arpeggios. And feel free to do the same too. I think you want to be able to use both positions interchangeably and be equally comfortable with both. And that's one of the main adjustments here in switching from a single trigger to a double trigger instrument is getting comfortable with those different combinations. So here we go from measure 13. One, two, three. Continue on, we'll sequence through a few more keys. So let's go on to A major. I'll stick with the bass trombone here for a minute. So now C sharp, you want to, on a single trigger instrument or a bass, double trigger bass trombone using only the F attachment, play that C sharp just about in exactly the same sixth position as you would play a low F. Try to not make any big accommodation there. Of course, always use your ears and make a small adjustment if you need it but it should line up really well in sixth position with the F attachment to play that C sharp, or if you're in a key where it would be a D flat, that same inharmonically spelled pitch, just right out there in sixth position with the trigger. So um, <clears throat> the other combination you can use for a C sharp on a double trigger bass trombone is you can use a, a slightly lengthened second position with both triggers for a C sharp. So once again, as we descend, here, I might alternate between using sixth position and using that double trigger second. But again, use your ears and get comfortable with both options. Rather than thinking as one, one of them being an alternate position to the other, think of it that you just have two good options that you need to be equally comfortable with in starting to explore this low register. So here we go, A major. One, two, three. <laughs> Also notice that with the double trigger bass trombone, when I'm playing some of these upper notes in the staff, like say this C sharp here, of course you would have the option, you could play it in a trigger second, um, a double trigger second, but I would avoid doing that in that register because if you go ahead and experiment with that and try it, you'll notice a significant difference in the tone quality up there in, in the staff of the bass clef. 
when you use um, the double trigger combination up in the staff, it doesn't yield quite the same um, resonant tone quality. But it's, it's very nice and pleasant down in, in the low trigger register below the staff. So I would use generally use your double trigger combinations only in the low register below the bass uh, clef staff rather than using it as a position option up in the staff. It would give you endless options, but all of them would be of somewhat compromised tone quality in the staff, in my opinion. Though there are some exceptions we can talk about, especially on the single trigger side, like say, for example, instead of B flat and first, using B flat and three and a half quite a lot, or, you know, A and a short fifth, so those can be nice. But in terms of using the double trigger combination in the staff, it's, it's a quite different tone quality um, and, and so if you just experiment with that, I, th I think you'll notice that. So use it for the, for the low register. All right, let's go on to A flat. And just for fun, I'm going to switch back to tenor trombone just to sort of illustrate that, again, building um, confidence down into the low register, um, you can do that quite effectively on a tenor trombone. You don't necessarily to be, need to be holding a bass trombone to play in the bass trombone uh, register down there or to get a nice, big, rich, resonant sound. So use doubling on bass trombone and getting comfortable on the bass to help you open up your sound and register um, down low register on the tenor trombone. And then vice versa, having facility on a bass trombone can really help you efficiently use air, taking great breaths, using a, a, a nice relaxed wind flow can transfer over very nicely back to tenor. So I find that doubling between tenor and bass is really mutually reinforces some positive things in my playing. It wasn't all that way, uh, always that way. When I first made the switch, it, 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 it was kind of disorienting for me. So it does take some adjusting, but if you really work on shoring up your fundamentals and approach it from the right mindset, there are aspects of each instrument which can really nicely benefit the other, and it's a really complementary double. Hey, Jimmy, right. I've yes, got sir. one question before we move on. Uh -huh. And um, you actually answered my question um, about the D and C sharp in the staff with the double trigger combination mm -hmm. on the bass trombone, um, about usually not using those. Mm -hmm. um, are there any situations, maybe in music, uh, maybe if it's fast, like a sixteenth passage or something like that, would you use them, or or and have you used them, the double trigger in the staff? Um, no, actually. Uh... I don't know that I ever have chosen to use them in a performance setting. I think I've experimented with it and pretty quickly discarded that idea. Um, I suppose there could be a scenario where it could work, but I feel like if it's that quick in a moving passage, I actually have more facility and matching tone quality if I go ahead and visit the quote unquote uh, uh, normal position on the, the B flat side of the, the instrument. Um, so for the most part, I, I wouldn't use it uh, in the staff. Now, there are a lot of players who might independently use, if you have an independent bass trumpet on the second valve, which is usually tuned in G flat, use that independently. But for the purposes of this video today, I'm approaching primarily the double trigger bass trombone as a dependent instrument. Um, and even to this day in my playing, I primarily use my independent bass trombone as a dependent instrument. And only with rare exceptions do I use that independent second valve, the G flat valve, independently and by itself. It can come in handy every once in a while, but I can also get along just as effectively without it. And I think in learning the double and working on really matching, matching uh, resonant tone quality down into the pedal register, it can be helpful to just sort of limit the sonic possibilities and, and position uh, and intonation possibilities of using an intimate valve initially. So um, that's why I'm approaching it that way, in case you were wondering why I'm not expounding on all the possibilities of using the independent system. All right, does that answer the question well enough? Yes, I, th I think that does. I was just, I was curious, and I, and I know I, there's some probably curious listeners that might have that same question too, so. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's a really good point. Um, there might be some community options, like, hey, you could map out, you could play a B flat major scale playing the B flat in first, the C in first, and the D in first, and only have to move your slide once you get to E flat. But I think if you experiment with doing that, you'll hear a marked difference in tone quality when you do that. Tell you what, since my bass trombone's right here, let me do it. Who knows? Maybe it'll sound great on Zoom and everybody will <laughs> be like, I don't know why doesn't he do that. Maybe I think I will do that. But I think you'll hear the difference in tone quality, particularly on the D. The C, I think, sounds really solid, but the D, yeah. 
question questionable. <laughs> I even used A in first position with the trigger. Again, I would never probably do that in performance, but um, just to sort of illustrate that having the valves doesn't mean necessarily that we should always use them up in, in upper edge. They can come in handy for in, in maybe some special extended technique circumstances or maybe even for some trills. There are, there are some advantages of having them there. Uh, and, and utilizing them occasionally, but I wouldn't necessarily use them uh, in, as a default setting up in that register. I would use them with caution and only rarely. So let's continue on down to A flat. And my goal with this warm up today is to get us on down to the pedal F. After that, you're on your own. <laughs> All right, here we go A flat. One, two, three, four. <laughs> note about the trigger C on a tenor trombone. To really get it in tune on a tenor trombone, you probably have to adjust the F attachment tuning slide a little bit or be in a really long seventh position. And even then, if you're being really honest with the tuner, you probably have to lip it down a little bit. So in, in, a, in a positioning chart, it might tell you you have that C down there in seventh and you do, but you're probably lipping it just a little bit. So just, just know that, that it's as long, as far out there as you can comfortably reach in seventh position to play that trigger C on a single trigger combination or whether it's on tenor or bass. So playing it on the double trigger bass trombone in, in um, <clears throat> three and a half, fourth position or so, use your ears again to exactly place that where you need it. Um, uh, gives you maybe a little more security of pitch. But again, being uh, equally fluent with both of those combinations. I'll continue on tenor for now just for time. So here we go, starting on that pedal A flat and working our way back up this arpeggio. Some things to think about as we do this. Constant airflow through the arpeggio. Use the tongue, the legato tongue, only when necessary. In other words, use natural slur possibilities and use the valve itself to articulate the legato connection between notes as much as possible. What I mean by that is whenever I go from the open side of the horn to engaging the valve, you can have the option in legato to let the engagement of the valve or the release of the valve serve as your articulation. Uh, so uh, you don't necessarily to need to also tongue it when you do that. You might find it, it gives a smoother connection occasionally um, if you do that because the valve, uh, especially upon release, can release quite quickly and, and um, if your air is at all pressurized, it can give you a, a, a fairly quick attack that might not match your other legato. So again, use your ears for intonation, but also use it for the style of connections and notes. But in general, do these as natural slurred as possible. So you wanna be focusing on the resonance and the continuity of air and the continuity of buzz and using the legato tongue only when necessary to avoid unintentional glissando. All right, here we go. Starting in measure 61 in this pedal A flat and working our way back up. One, two, three. <sighs> G major. And um, before I switch to bass trombone and play this entire exercise, I just want to talk about the low B. As a tenor trombone player, this note is not 
um, technically speaking, um, uh, on our slide with the trigger combination, but it can be accessible if you lip it down a half step. So I'll just play this last arpeggio here beginning in the 6-2 measure. I'll play it quite slowly and I'll lip down to that B on the tenor trombone. <laughs> It's there in terms of pitch, um, but it might not yield quite the same resonant tone quality. But I would um, go ahead and practice being able to lip down that half step, which is technically what you're doing, because you're out in a long seventh with a single trigger, which should yield a C, so you're lipping it down a half step. In that low trigger register, you do have the ability to do that with a minimal trade-off of sound, though there is a little bit of a trade-off but you can play that chromatic pitch down there. Now let's switch to bass trombone and have some fun. So. <clears throat> All right. So um, we'll play down this arpeggio using the bass trombone. Here we go, G major, one, two, ready. <laughs> Exactly on the hand slide is that B, you might ask. You can, of course, look it up uh, in any sort of positioning or fingering chart, positioning chart, let's call it. If we're talking about fingering charts, we're talking about but lazy button pushers. We don't want to be those. We're, we're, <laughs> we're slide trombonists, right? All right. Um, so that, that B probably lines up about five and a half. You could maybe conceptualize it as a short six. Um, but uh, with both triggers down. So you'll probably be sharp if you think of it as a fifth position with both triggers, and you'll probably be flat if you put it in sixth position with both triggers. But again, you need to use your ears. But here's where you have to be cautious. With both triggers down there, um, well, really from F on down in the single trigger, but particularly from D on down in the double trigger, you have a lot of flexibility within the, the, that note down there. You can lip it quite a lot without realize you're doing so. So you want to go for efficiency and centering it as much as possible without lipping it up or lipping it down. You want to find the nice resonant core of the note for the appropriate placement of the hand slide. All right. So let's continue from that uh, pedal G on up. Here we go. Two. Ready? <laughs> G flat major. Now for the pedal B flat on a double trigger bass trombone you actually have two options. You can of course play the pedal B flat in an open first position um, but you also would have the option of playing the pedal B flat out in seventh position with both triggers. So as we descend down that arpeggio I might switch that up a little bit um, so feel free to do whichever is comfortable for you but know that the sound will probably come more immediately um, in first position will be bigger, more resonant, because when you're using it in double trigger seventh, you're playing on a pretty long bass trombone because you've lengthened the hand slide all the way out to seventh and you've engaged both slides. If you could imagine it, it would be sort of like playing a, a, a tenor trombone in 14th position. You've lengthened the, the instrument that, that long, okay, which is sort of a funny thought to think of, you know, how long our arms would need or how long of a handle we would need out there. But um, so it's a pretty long instrument. So there's just a standing air column within the instrument 
that needs to be excited with vibration. And because there's all that standing wind resistance in the horn, it can be a little stuffy. So you want to just be free and moving with your wind and, and uh, play a nice, rich, resonant sound. Um, but as a little asterisk here, I have had tenor trombone players who switched to bass who maybe initially their pedal register wasn't so secure. And they've actually really helped improve their pedal register especially that transition down to a pedal B flat by using that double trigger seventh and getting comfortable with that out there because they found that they were more comfortable in the triggers initially before they got to the pedals and then learn the feel of that just help them open up their pedal register a little bit. So just a little bit of a side note there. Here we go and G flat major. One, two, three. <laughs> on that last arpeggio I snuck in the double trigger seventh. All right, here we go, working our way up from the bottom, starting on that pedal G flat. Two, ready. <laughs> Again, knowing some of your optional position or alternate position possibilities using D flat in a long trigger two or D flat in sixth, using pedal B flat or in first or in seventh with both triggers an option, and also in the staff on this B flat being able to access that uh, alternate position. D flat in, in about three and a half with the single trigger. So, all right, I believe we have arrived here at our last key. We'll do, we'll do F and, uh, and, and, and call it a day from there and proceed on to, you, to your, the rest of your warm up after this. And uh, this exercise is a really standard part of my daily routine. I was a student of Buddy Baker's in undergraduate school and uh, I've gradually adapted a lot of his exercises uh, for my own playing routine. And I find it really refreshing to warm up and connect sound across two octaves like this. And on a daily basis, I play on my tenor trombone down as low as I can go, um, as low as I'm resonating sound. And on bass trombone, I think it's really handy to start here in the middle, middle register and work on connecting your great core mid-register sound right on down into the pedal range rather than simply getting out a bass trombone and just going for those pedal notes and dropping sort of depth charge sounds like down in the pedal register. There's, there's certainly a call for that in the repertoire and there's a place for working on the immediacy of sound and response and consistency down there like that. But for me, I really prefer bridging the sound and connecting the sound across the octaves before I, I, I spend a lot of time just like landing on those pedals, <laughs> um, just sort of out of the blue. So here we go. F major, we'll have some fun. I'm going to alternate between using F and trigger first, the pedal F and trigger first, or F and sixth. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs>
one last point I want to add here that I probably should have made right at the beginning of these exercises, but in the first key or two, we didn't play a trigger C, so it kind of slipped off my radar screen. But I would say regarding intonation on this C in the staff, like measure 121, you need to adjust the hand, sli hand slide out a little bit for that. So tune your trigger so that this low F, this one right here, is in tune in first. But if you leave the hand slide all the way in and play a C in the staff, that's quite sharp. That's not a perfect fifth. That's a slightly um, augmented imperfect fifth. Again, if I don't adjust it, you can hear the ripeness of the sound, the brightness. That color is a little distracting. So take care that you're not positioning all the way in and lipping it down. Let me do that. So I think the pitch evened out, but the color became slightly muffled and muted because I was lipping it down maybe a quarter of a fifth of a tone to get it in tune. Um, so always position really accurately right in the center of the pitch and resonate right in the center of the slot of that note. And take care as you approach your transition into bass trombone that you're not learning to lip notes. In other words, being lazy about positioning and letting there be too much flexibility in how much you're moving around the center of the pitch to be able to play that pitch. You'll find probably that your, open, your low register opens up more quickly if you really focus on being accurate with buzzing right in the center of the pitch with where you place the hand slide. It's more easy to refine exactly where you place it than it is if you learn it with a distortion of the embouchure by lipping it. Unlearning that is a longer road. So I urge you right from the beginning to be really accurate with where you're placing the hand slide and listen a lot. So are there any, any questions? We've gotten down to a pedal F. I would say if you get down to a pedal F, that's the start of a good day. You can, of course, continue on from there. But um, a lot of bass trombone player, if you've got a solid uh, a bass trombone repertoire, if you've got a solid pedal F, you're off to a really good start. And of course, you can work down from there all the way down to really a double pedal B flat. But um, if you're down to a pedal F and got consistency of sound going down there and consistency of attack and great fundamentals going, it, you're off to a really good start. It's, it's, it's the start of a good day. So I encourage you to use this as part of your warm up and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Professor Driscoll, any questions? Yeah, th thank you very much. That's that's fantastic. So make sure everybody uses that as a play along for if you're in band class, especially now. Now you have Zoom, um, Zoom High School, Zoom University, whatever else. So use this as your as your warm up play along or tutorial. Um, I, sh I have one quick question, and then uh, and then we'll be done with our video too. Um, you had mentioned the lipping down and manipulating the pitch you know with the with the trigger c um and then i'm re referencing the first video when you had you had said something about um in the band if if you are lacking trombone players or you do need a low sound or you just need a traditional bass trombone player um and you've transferred a euphonium player or maybe a trumpet player mm -hmm. um and they're they're used to doing some lipping with, for their intonation, um, do you have a recommendation for that, or, or how would you go about that? Oh, I see your question. Yeah, uh, that's one of the fundamental in differences between uh, uh, trumpet, euphonium, and and trombone playing, uh, because uh, as and I'll make the connection most directly between euphonium. Because in euphonium, uh, it's really kind of standard practice. Like you have to have that ability to lip around the pitch, especially when you you get up, up above the staff in the sixth partial, seventh partial, et, et cetera. You, they're bending notes into place all the time. And the instrument is very forgiving of that because it has that nice open conical bore. And it gives you a lot of flexibility in, in the sound there. So I would just urge you, if you are switching to uh, bass trombone from a valve instrument, particularly euphonium or perhaps tuba, that, that you are, are um, really diligent about um, making sure that your slide position is accurate. And it can be tough to kind of uh, wade through that. But 
one thing I would just sort of equip you with is just maybe an example here. Let's, uh, I'll start in the staff on an F and, and I'll, I'll start with a centered sound and then I'll lip it down a little bit. And uh, we'll see just what comes through with the audio quality on, on Zoom on our connection today and, and, uh, and, and all that, but hopefully it'll be audible to you. So starting on an F. Kind of centered sound. Now notice I'm tuned my B flat trombone, so B flat is in tune. So when I play that F in the staff, because it's the third partial of a trombone, without really telling you, I'm out just a little bit. I, I'm not all the way in first position because the third partial of a B flat F tenor trombone or a B flat F G flat D bass trombone, that third partial <laughs> on the B flat side of the horn is a little bit sharp. But the sixth partial, because it's another octave higher, is even sharper. But here on the third partial, if you park and bark as it were all the way in, you'll probably be sharp. And if you're not hearing it sharp, odds are you're lipping it down. I don't know if you hear much in the difference pitch level because what I'm trying to do is position sharp, but play in tune. So that's where we have to be careful. So now I'll lip it some more. bend it back up to pitch. Now I'll we'll start relatively slotted in the note and I'll bend it high. I bend it to the point where I started to flip up to the next partial. So you can see that there's a pretty significant uh, drop in the tone quality and the, the pleasing character or the resonance of the sound. Whereas on euphonium, you can bend that pitch and, and it's still quite pleasing and resonant and, and tuneful. But on trombone, if you lip flat of the center of the pitch. And what I mean by like where you place the hand slide, where you have this tuned here, if you lip low in the slot of that note, it'll become dull in sound, possibly airy. Um, and it might also affect the immediacy of your sound in the sense that when you attack and you're lipping it down, even from the onset of the note, you might get airy attacks or a little scoop up from below. If you're too tight, uh, you might get a quick response to the note. I, I don't know if you might fall from the partial above. And you might have to fine tune that. But more than anything, you'll feel tight here. You'll you'll tight. Uh, you'll tire quickly. That'll be one thing you'll notice. Um, uh, but uh, more than anything, it'll be that tone quality. It'll be bright and like it's on an E syllable. E. Instead, I like to think, e nice big ah, and I think that'll even that out. So whether you're lipping it flat or sharp, you will notice that you fatigue more quickly. And uh, so that so some ways to, to work on that, list, record yourself, listen to your tone quality. You could play along with a tuning drone. Um, I think that's very uh, healthy to do. The other thing you can do is play with a duet partner. A teacher would be the best, most ideal option. And uh, you can, of course, refer to a tuner. Now, just a little bit of an asterisk about a tuner. The tuners are really honest. They are, but they can also be very, very demoralizing. All right. <laughs> you know, I've played trombone for the better part of, well, 30 years. And I use it today to a certain extent on my playing to check in, to make sure that I'm centering where I need to. But I don't practice with a tuner on my stand. And, and uh, I don't look at it a lot. It's better to use your ears and to use it as a reference guide every now and then when you have a question, when you feel a little crossed up, when you're trying to work your way out of the weeds. But I wouldn't sit there and practice with the tuner telling you how in tune or not you are on each individual note. Use your ears, okay? So uh, that, that's just my personal uh, recommendation there is to check in with the tuner, use it to set your pitch level um, but we start to react. So when I see, if I, if I play a note and I notice it tells me a little flat, what do I do? Well, I lip it in <laughs> tune. And then, well, okay, I'm in tune. Well, what I actually did was I subconsciously adjusted it to make it in tune without adjusting my hand slide where I need. And uh, we, we can tend to do that as we play through passages and that's what really tires us out. So uh, I, I, would, I would really just 
you know, let your ear guide you, and also check in with your, your stress level in terms of your armature, how quickly you're fatiguing. If you notice you're playing uh, just a nice, comfortable dynamic, but you're still fatiguing quickly, you could find that you're really ripping stuff around a lot. Yeah, that's very good. <clears throat> um, all right, well, I guess that's all the questions I have. And uh, I want to thank you to Dr. Jimmy Robertson here. Um, helping out with video too um, and we will probably in another week we'll have video three <laughs> coming right. and uh, Dr. Uh, Casey Thomas will come back and visit us and he'll probably he's going to have some more information about his uh, double valve and all his valve um, uh, notations and then a few exercises of his own so um, right. I appreciate everybody listening and share with your band directing friends and who whoever else you might think uh, can get something from this video. So. Uh, All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. And thank you.